McQueen got really expensive really, really quickly. Uh, so I, McQueen is something that I, uh, you know, I did love. And also the thing that's very interesting, and I wish I could collect more of it, is I think in the 90s there was a lot of stuff where it was McQueen and Galliano in terms of pitched as competitors with one another. And I, but I do think there was a competition between them and they were kind of spurring each other on to kind of different levels of excellence. So I think it's a very interesting time and I would love to have more McQueen from that period. I do have some of it, but for instance, my favorite McQueen collection ever is Dante. Um, and getting pieces from Dante is so impossible and has, has been for a long time. They were very expensive pieces at the time. I'm old enough to remember trying to buy them when I was a kid. Um, but they, you know, it, they're very expensive and very difficult to get hold of, unfortunately. Although I do actually have a piece from Susie's sale. When Susie did her auction, I bought a McQueen Givenchy leopard jacket from that, which is really fabulous. And I might wear it sometimes, but... Um, and, um, so thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and, and because um, we, in, in the history, uh, Phil, we used to compare McQueen and Galliano, and because you know so much, so well, the pieces and design created. Um, um, and take, for instance, the Bies dress. I think it's a, a Galliano is a master for the Bies because he's so inspired in the 1930s. He also saw some glimpses of the 70s also, uh, sometimes. And um, what's the difference that uh, you think between uh, Galliano and McQueen vision? on the same technique, for instance, like the BS cut? I think, without wanting to be too kind of generalized, I think if you look at the clothes, Galliano's vision of a woman is much more delicate and McQueen's vision of a woman is much more strong. I think McQueen was quite instinctively a tailor and the way he cut his clothes had this kind of, um, had a sharpness to it that I don't think Galliano had or wanted. Um, so I think for me, I always found it interesting that people compared them because I think there were two British designers that went to French couture houses. There's a very obvious comparison to be made, but they're very different designers. Um, I think they have very different intentions in what they were doing, in how they wanted to kind of present their work. Um, I think it's, it, you know, it's actually really weird. It, it's obvious why you compare them, but it's quite weird to compare them in a sense because they are such different designers. You know, I, I think McQueen, McQueen's vision of women was much harder and Galliano's was much softer. That's the way that I always look at it. And I think that actually kind of permeates the way they looked at their work in lots of different ways. I think, you know, and when people talk about the romance of McQueen, it always makes me really like want to throw up because I don't think McQueen was ever really about romance. I think it was about making women look tough and hard and, you know, I don't want to say brutal, but, you know, it, it was about kind of really empowering women and making them look really, yeah, making them look incredibly strong. And I think John had a very different intention. It wasn't about that. It was about this kind of beauty. And it was about romance. I think he was about romance. And McQueen was about this kind of, you know, uh, savage beauty. It was a really great exhibition title. That's what McQueen was about. And here you have some invitations. So what we call in the medium field, ephemeris. Mm. And there is some invite and maybe you could describe because it's sometimes surprising. The, the invites are amazing. I always loved Galliano invitations. Um, I don't have all of them here. I also was given by my very good friend, who I'm not going to embarrass, um, a matryoshka doll with a charm bracelet inside from Galliano's circus collection, which I treasure. Um, but one of the most amazing ones is this, which is the sleeve from the Autumn Winter 1996 collection. And I know that the de Young Museum in San Francisco, um, who acquired a lot of the uh, clothes of Dodie Rosencrantz, who was a big Galliano supporter, they saw this in her wardrobe and didn't take it because they didn't know what it was, but she kept it for like 15, 20 years. Um, but all of these invitations are amazing and people have given me them, which has been incredibly generous of them because the, these extraordinary things where they only made a couple of hundred, but it was something that was important for John and it was kind of the first step into entering his world was getting this invitation, whether it was the torn off sleeve or the ballet slipper in the box or a, you know, a, a handbag filled with kind of lipsticks and things. It was the idea that it was the first step on the kind of journey into the fantasy with him. Um, and so, yeah, for me to have them, the things I remember seeing pictures of, in, again, pictures of in magazines when I was a child, this is a recurrent thing. 
Um, but you know, I grew up in the middle of the countryside in, in the north of England. I didn't have access to a lot of this stuff. So it was really looking through magazines and seeing things on TV that like drew, pulled me into fashion. So being able to have all of those different elements, it's, it's kind of part of that dream that I had when I was a kid. And um, about pieces here, you're talking about romance, and there is one collection, and you have a pieces here where the romance was a bit questioned at the time. Yes. Um, uh, it was in 2001, I, I uh, 2000, the, the, the cloche art, yeah. the homeless collection, yes. And just here, it's a jumpsuit? Yes. Um, just behind. I mean, that I think is interesting because it's obviously part of this collection and this sequence, but it's also one of those moments when if you were getting a collection from 2000, you want a piece from Dior's Homeless collection because it was so controversial. You know, literally people were picketing and rioting outside of the Dior shop when it happened. Um, it's, you know, for me, it's, it's interesting looking at it. And when I got hold of that piece to look at the kind of craft and the work in it, it's really extraordinary how they reproduce certain effects using kind of haute couture techniques. Um, you, you know, translating this idea of kind of things falling apart. But then also the, you know, the other interesting thing with that collection is there's multiple layers to the inspiration. It isn't just look, you know, trying to kind of reproduce the, the clothes of, of kind of, of people on the street. It's the idea of all these references to kind of historical rag balls, to, to this kind of um, tradition in the 1930s when aristocrats would dress up in kind of tattered clothes. And I think it was as a, as a way to raise money for charity. Um, so there's all these different references. I think that's a thing I always find interesting in Galliano's work is the sort of complexity, the layers of referencing. It's never straightforward. There's always those kind of layers of, of ideas behind everything and then combined with sort of technical virtuosity. That's the thing, the fusion that I find super interesting in everything that he does really from, from the very start until today. And how many pieces do you have now? Do you own? In total, of everything, um, I think about 2,000, but I need to count. As you might have, I mean, it was a bit of a nightmare getting this stuff together because I have no system and I have no pictures and the girls at Reese are really fabulous in bearing with the kind of crapo pictures that I send them to represent what these dresses look like. I mean, I've not, honestly, I've not seen the majority of these dresses on mannequins. I've not seen them on people. I've never taken them out of the box. So to see it like this is a treat and as much of a surprise for me as it is for everybody else. And do you still have a, a, a Graal, some, like a very some, an, an important pieces you don't have? Yes, yet. lots. So I, I really piece. want a crinoline from the Princess Lucretia collection. I think also there's certain things where I'm like, once I get this, then that year is done. I don't have to think about this collection anymore. So yes, to get a crinoline from Princess Lucretia, I don't know how I would store it or where I would store it, but to get a crinoline, that would mean that spring, summer 1994 is finito. Don't need to think about it anymore. So that's a message sent to the universe. Yes, <laughs> I, have, I have been talking to someone about one, uh, but there needs to be discussions on price. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, are we good? Uh, one more? <laughs> I think one more and then we've got to all run to Armani. Run, yeah. Yes. Maybe you, if you have any questions uh, from the audience. Hi. 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 I am, no, I, I used to be a big collector. Also, uh, John, I have many pieces too. But at one point I found this one, like, uh, not anymore uh, something that I like to carry, but something that in my uh, caliber. Mm. I like, I much prefer to see closer. Uh, my mannequin, of course, I uh, alive again. That's why I give her back. Uh, yeah. I give a lot of stuff, you know? Because if you take the clothes into the box, it's a treasure nobody can share with you, you know? Then uh, I think uh, this collection doesn't have any more sense. We have to regenerate, we have to give uh, to the young generation this kind of uh, 90, incredible 90 example of style uh, of John or everyone. Because otherwise I feel like you can come in a, in a you know, with all this uh, liquid around me. Yeah. You don't feel the same? I, 
it's interesting. No, I've had things like that. And people have asked me what I want to do with it at the end. I'm like, brick it up with me. When I die, it's going in the coffin with me. No one's ever getting it. Um, but no, I think there is that. But also, I mean, I always say when people ask me about collecting, I always quote, politically incorrectly quote the Duchess of Windsor, who said the possession of beautiful things is thrilling to me. And there is that. But also it is, you know, I do show them to be, even if they're in a box, you know, I've shown them to students, I've shown them to people, and there is this sense of, you know, I show them to people that just come to my house that have no interest in this whatsoever. <laughs> but there is this thing of being able to open this box and be like, look at this, look how, look how fucking great this is. These, this is Susanna and Katie that work with me. They've been at the office when I've had something delivered and been like, look how fucking great this is. Um, so there is that. I, I do see myself as kind of safeguarding things as well, trying to look after them, trying to make sure they can kind of have a further life. But I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with it in the end. Maybe I'll get tired of it and sell it all. I know a few people that have all of a sudden been like, I just want to release this back into the world. So maybe I will do that at some point in time. But it's, it, you know, it's nice that I can kind of have it now. I can have it for a period of time and maybe share it with some people and maybe let people wear it. It's certainly not something that's, that's gonna be, sorry, locked up and kept like it is in a museum. It's, you know, the idea is that it can have a bit of a life and a bit of, of freedom. Um, but no, I understand exactly what you mean. But it's not hit that on me just yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great to be able to get it out and to show it to people, you know? don't know that period so many pieces here that you're collecting again they know that you're the early George pieces yeah yeah so thank you Alex thank you all so much thank you all. I'm sorry we've all got to run but thank you <laughs>